This is In Boot Camp, episode 15, sequelized on Sunday, April 28th, 2019. And now, throw a sloth around the room with your host, Matthew Petchel and Ryan Rampersett. You can find the show notes for this episode at thenexus.tv slash IB15. Hey. Hey, how's it going today? It's good. How about you? Good. We missed another snowstorm. So glad about that. We finally missed another snowstorm. We had to put up with just clouds, and that was okay. Yes. So, even though um, spring is here and is normally, you know, the good time of the year and stuff, I got a really bad cold this week. Yeah, that can happen. Yeah, kind of skipped class two of the three days. Well, you know, you actually have an excuse to do that. It's not like you can just walk to class from the dorm, and, you know, it's not like you're paying, like, $17,000 a year to go to class, so it's not too bad. And class is always recorded, and you can always Skype it with Zoom. So I feel like that's that's a pretty responsible way to still go to class without getting everybody else sick and, you know. The good news is you don't get called on. Because uh, the, the teacher always throws a sloth around the room saying, okay, whoever gets the sloth has to answer the question, and then he just throws it. Wait, and then, wait, um, wait, wait, wait. Throws a sloth. Oh, it's a, it's, it's, it's a stuffed animal sloth. It, it's not like a real sloth. Okay. So he throws a stuffed animal around, and whoever the animal hits, um, they have to answer the question. I, I've never heard of such a thing, but that's interesting. Oh no! It, it's it's totally totally real. Uh, okay then. So, uh, what what have you been learning in class, even though you've been sick? What what's been going on this week? Well, um, to start things off, last week, my instructor told me, Matt, you should use Linux more. And I am like, wow, I'm glad to do that. So first thing I did this week was I completely got rid of Windows. You got rid of Windows on your laptop. Again. uh, For the second time, I have wiped my computer that is just a few months old. So uh, if if everybody redirects their attention to the uh, episode zero, Matt had installed Ubuntu on that computer at the time uh but and, then he was they specifically said but he was worried cannot use linux that he was breaking the rules and matt is nothing but a rule follower when it suits him I and like nothing but a rule breaker when it suits him so he decided to uh try it again after he was given basically explicit permission yes i, I like being i like being micromanaged because i can't do anything on my own and um yeah yeah so what and Ubuntu also, did you install on your computer? The brand new one, Disco Dango, and you have had it installed on your machine because you upgraded early, right? I just did an in-place upgrade, and it said, okay, the latest one is this number, and go ahead. And I did it, yeah. and it works fine. So it's brand new. And so you know how um, Ubuntu has a... Like how Aptitude and Snap have like repositories that they predetermine packages for and everything else. Like, like it just came out and it came with like Node like ten point oh five something. Like it was like really it, it was super old. Um, whenever you npm installed stuff, all packages would just be like, "Hey, you you really need to upgrade." Yeah, that's I I don't know why the Node package in Ubuntu uh on, in the repository is so old. So normally what I do is I'll either install it from node source manually, which is not really hard at all, or I will um, use Linux Brew and just install it to that. I could not tell you how I did it, but I built it from source just by doing the download thing, and I got node 12 on now. Yeah, that's fine, too. Every guide is different. They, when, the way you extract a tar file is it's different, just every, different time. every time. Yeah, I know. So uh, has your uh, laptop been stable running this new release? Yes, yes. Um, I've had some problems with... Um, so right now I have both... Um, I have the laptop lid shut and outputting the two monitors, yeah. one over the Type-C and then one through the native HDMI port. Mm-hmm. Coming out of that, I've had some problems with the laptop thinking the screen's upside down or rotated 90 degrees. And I don't know why that happens. Yeah. But right now it is. Drivers are and, the answer, obviously. Yeah. Oh, they're free and open. They're awesome. Yeah, sure. Actually, no, Ubuntu does do a whole bunch of closed proprietary drivers. And, and they still else. don't work, so it doesn't matter. 
So has running Ubuntu um, been okay during class time? Obviously, you weren't there, so I guess people wouldn't have been as confused seeing it. But well, yeah, one my, my um, we do partner stuff and stuff, and then in class on Saturday, the person next to me noticed right away that um, your background changed, like not just the background. And then I virtual desktop, and like, oh, that's cool. Did you know that operating systems are wallpaper deep? That is that is as far as you need to know about how it works. But this is the one that thinks that and has always got their head down. I know, I, I know, and, I, I'm aware. Yeah. So that's uh, that's good. Now you you were telling me that you were struggling installing MySQL or something last week. Y- yes. Um, I found so I installed it, but I couldn't access it. Um, somebody posted on um the wonderful Stack Overflow that run this MySQL use native password something something would fix everything like no way and then yeah that that did it yeah so I think um I think and I don't remember what day that you asked me about that or told me about that I'm not sure what happens during the week really anymore uh you were running MySQL 8 and MySQL 8 is of course the latest version historically everybody uses MySQL 5.7 because equivalently they are feature identical Except 5.7 works, whereas MySQL 8 does not. Yes. I have right now 5.7.25. Yeah. Good choice. That's the good one. I am. I also quizzed you about um, D-Beaver. D-Beaver. I have the community edition of D-Beaver because I don't have 600 bucks or whatever it was. Yeah, that's a lot. Um, I can't inspect tables in a nice view i can see individual rows and individual columns but i don't know how to bring up the overlay i think it's a lack of knowledge and not just a feature that's only in the paid version yeah i don't i don't remember either it's been many years since i've used dbeaver i have uh, a since switched to the paid but massively superior data grip in visual studios code there is an extension for sql and it is allowing me to view the results oh, of that's table good stuff I mean, how often are you actually going into the table to fix the stuff you break? Uh, never. I, I you mean, never have to do that. All the time, like, during development, but but of course, once you start getting further than that, not so much. Yeah, you, you know what they say, if you just code it right, it works. Yeah, exactly. Do it right the first time. Yeah. My SQL Workbench was something that was on the Oracle's website, and I tried to install it. It had a deb package. I couldn't get it to run. No idea. I mean, it says it was running in the background. It said it was doing something. It said it successfully installed. Between dBeaver and the SQL extension for that, everything is just fine. And plus, um, when I actually start doing stuff, I'm going to have a you know, Docker Compose and have everything in there anyways. Right, so exactly. I'm not worried about it. Yeah, and then with Docker Compose, of course, you can just specify which version of MySQL you want to pull in. So you won't struggle with that in the future. Uh, that's actually how I run uh, all of my databases. I don't actually have any database tech installed directly on the machine that I use for work or personal development. Everything is just a Docker image, and I just expose the ports, and uh, just it can just spin up or down, and it's it's kind of nice that way. According to the internet and everything I read and stuff, everyone's in love with Docker. Yeah, I wouldn't say everybody's in love with it. I would say that it's very useful for uh, a variety of purposes, and it gets you out of uh, situations that pretty much everybody's experienced at least once or twice, or uh, I don't know, maybe a dozen times, and then instead of doing things poorly, you can do things better, and that is a way to do things better. So you know, I've been in this coding boot camp for weeks and weeks now. Oh, I don't know, maybe and... fifteen weeks, for example. Yes, exactly fifteen or sixteen. What? Is, no, oh, fifteen. You're you're correct. Um, hey, it's almost like we're recording IB fifteen. But so we've never had to, until last week, we've always kind of just had our files willy-nilly all over and stuff. And then we started using Express for templating and stuff. And then we started to actually have to have a views directory. And we started actually had to be careful of how we name things. Like, we have to use their convention, otherwise Express breaks and stuff. Yes. Now, on the other hand, I am sure you can configure some of those settings. So if you wanted to have something called not views be your views folder you could certainly do that but you'd have to set it manually and we're supposed to have like the main layout and stuff yeah and re- yeah and so that kind of continued um so now we're talking about um object relational mapping and stuff and how we're supposed to have our models folder and everything else and it's just a little different way of organizing your code 
Um, well, plus when we started doing um, express and making routes and stuff, things got a little messy too. So do you um, know what you call that pattern of following the rules for file layout and naming convention? Do you... Best practice or ORM? No. So it, it, there's there's a um, there's kind of multiple schools of thought in how to design a framework or a system. So there's the configuration method uh, or pattern, which is you can do whatever you want, but you have to configure the system in order to know what you want to do. So if you want to have a folder called views, you have to type in to the, the views property views. Or if you don't want to have it and you want to have it called my pages, you have to type into the views property my pages. But as you can guess, when you have a dozen configuration settings like that, it can get kind of overwhelming and then it's kind of a tedious thing to set up a new project every single time and have to name every single variable with a value. Yeah. There's the other school of thought, which is convention over configuration, which is the idea of having these pretty sensible and pretty much good enough for everybody defaults. And so in order to use the convention over configuration, you follow the rules and in return, it just works. And that's the way our class is heading. And it, it's it's a good practice. Uh, your your good friend Ruby on Rails kind of popularized uh, this convention over configuration practice. So Ruby on Rails came with dozens, if not hundreds of dozens. That is that how numbers work? Hundreds of dozens, yes. <laughs> of uh, features that were convention based instead of configuration based. So I am completely unfamiliar with Ruby on Rails. Like, was this like right after like? The internet? Like, when was Ruby's on Rails made? Uh, I don't know, 2005-ish, 2006. Okay, so early years of web yeah. stuff. Yes, exactly. So that's why everyone started copying their model. They were first. They were effectively the first on uh, making a sensible web framework that people could use to achieve something that was more than PHP back in the awful days of PHP. Jumping right into the next one. So we've been using SQL and stuff for a while, and we've been interacting with it directly and stuff. SQL, my SQL is great. Um, it's I know it's not the most popular database out there right now, but we've been using it. Now we're using a node package called SQLize. And what is SQLize? SQLize, oh, what is their definition? It is a, what do they call it? Well, you have it in the show notes, so you should know what it is. Yeah, but... Uh, they had a little spiel like, it's a promise-based something or other for handling all your databases that you could ever want to use. Well, that sounds reasonable. Well, it's like, basically, let's say you want to switch from, like, Postgres to SQL, or you want to, you know, move into the future or stuff, you'd have one file to configure instead of a million. Like, um, you, you set your dialect, and then you, you just you change one file in your model and then everything just magically works. So let's say somebody above you says, hey, we're no longer doing this. We're ignoring you developer people. We want you to use this database now. And, and so what, what, what is that pattern called? It is also object relational mapping. Yes, that, that's good. Very good. You, you, you read the words that you typed. The idea, that's what you're fishing for. Yeah, that's what I was fishing for. And so the, the popularity, popularity of ORMs is um, pretty high. What you will find in your bootcamp is that an ORM is great and is totally usable. I don't think you'll find the, the other hidden, darker, deeper truth, which is they are awful for many things that are too complicated for the little ORM to uh, to to understand or to model. Have you used SQLize at work? Yep, many times. Inevitably, we always come across something like, yeah, it sure would have been great if we didn't use this awful thing, but we oh. always use it every time because... One of the things that you have to compensate for, or at least understand that what you're getting into is you will inevitably not be working on the project you were working on right now, and so somebody else will have to work on it. And instead of making your own ORM or your own database layer or using MySQL directly, which opens your attack surface area up and your um, roll your own surface area up, it allows other developers to come in and understand quickly what's going on. And one of the cool thing they have with uh, SQLize is they have a CLI interface, and you can if you globally install the npm package, which I didn't know you could do that. Like I thought npm packages were only used inside of you know your JS files, and when you did like Node.js, that's the only way you could run it. But straight from the um, command line, you could just do 
SQLize init configs and then models and stuff, and then you can just automatically make your connections JSON file for you. Yep, it's pretty cool. And, which is really cool because well, you know how back when I was on Windows, hmm. I had two different. I had uh, MAMP going, and I also had SQL database thing that would create something on port uh, three thousand three hundred six, and then I also had like three thousand. 307 and i was always changing between ports um because i had uh problems sometimes yes most of the times i just use map on windows and just not having to go into the file just being able to go to the configuration json and just change it is a lot nicer yes for sure so t- so tell me about some of the terminology in in sqlize so like you mentioned models tell me what a model is model is just how you react or how it interacts with a sql directly and stuff so you don't once you set the dialect and stuff it's just it almost looks kind of javascript it's very englishy hold on i knew you're gonna fish for this so i have it open right now so one of our in-class projects this week was to make a uh twitter clone which was a project you said that everyone should always make yes it is one that everybody should always make remember when you're told to make work for three different people and stuff you made the wonderful twitter clone twitter clone Yep, called Chirp. Yeah. Oh, that's what we called ours. Yeah, we even copied their blue and their everything. Like oh. it is like a direct rip. Ours was red, um, so oh. branding. You know, that's good. Yep. Um, but instead of having like VCHA or uh, not v- VAR chars and other things and stuff, so it's just like, so let's say you wanted to like make a database that had like the author of the Chirp. Um, it would be sequelized dot string. Um, and like, it's just, you know, dot integer like that it's completely different like you would never be able to tell that you're handling sql right and so that's that's an abstraction on the underlying you know data store so like whether it was a mongo thing or a postgres thing or my sql thing it could just take yeah. in string and then pick the type that was most equivalent and one thing I don't like, so you know how when you're using new technology and stuff, you don't know what every line does. You just, you know, you have to have it if it doesn't work. I am frequently um, familiar with that. Yeah. Um, so one of the things we have to do is this dot sync, and I don't know what it does. I would have to see it in source code. However, what sync does is that if you change your uh, model structure um, between uh, startup of your node service, it will change the database structure for you automatically. Okay. So, for example, what you could do is, let's say you have a user model representing a user table in your database, and you wanted to have a, uh, I don't know, like you had first name, and now you want to have last name also. Well, you would add last name to your model, and then when you start up your service again, sync will run, and it will add with an alter statement that additional field into your database table okay oh and it also makes more so in um when we were just doing mysql in general and stuff it always it made a primary key for us and it auto incremented it but um the sequelize adds a date created field and a date altered field yes those are pretty fancy Um, aren't they yeah, I mean, it did it automatically. I'm like, whoa, I didn't tell it to do that. And it's just kind of cool that it just does stuff on its own. Yeah. Uh, some of those, I don't I don't know what if MySQL, I mean, uh, I don't know if SQL has a special name for those. But those kind of like meta data fields are uh, extremely useful. Uh, and we we made extensive use of those in our code as well. One thing it can't do is actually create the database, though. Right. I still had to have like a schema.sql or just just to create the database. But to make the tables, to edit the uh, columns of the table and everything else, that's all done in SQLize. Yep. Which is pretty cool. Have you looked at the uh, migrations feature at all? No. No, I have not. Tell me about these migration features. Yeah, they're pretty cool. You probably won't need them for a little while. Uh, but the idea of the migration is similar to using sync, but in a more coordinated way. One of the problems you will encounter when you're working on a uh, project with a database with code changing that database uh, with on a team is that you know you'll make a change to the database. Maybe you're the person adding last name to the users table, but then one of your team members decides to add a phone number to the users table. And so how do you coordinate those changes in a Git stored way? 
And that method, it could be using the migrations feature in SQLize. And it basically allows you to have a file that represents changes to the table layout uh, over time. And it can be checked in. Merge conflicts can be resolved on files, of course, with Git. So it, it allows you to be uh, safer and more um, systematic with how your database uh, changes over time. Huh. So it's pretty cool. Oh, that's always good. Mm -hmm. So does it do anything that, like, say one of your group members just drops a table and deletes everything? It that help does, you not, that? does not help you with uh, not reading code that your group members submit, but what it will help you is that you will enforce that if somebody drops a table, there will be a migration for that table being dropped, and if you all decide that, Yes, that was part of the plan. You will be able to accept that file being in the migrations list. Or if it's not a part of the plan, you can reject their PR and say, no, you did it wrong. Yeah. And that is a great segue. Next week on Saturday, the day we have the combined classes, which I think is really weird, it will be the first day of our group project two, when we'll be put into teams. Oh, group project two. So you do get a different team. I'm hoping. I am really hoping. Um, we we have to. There's no way they'd use the same team. I hope so. I mean, it's always good to have a different team, spread the knowledge around a little bit more. Yeah. Um, but it's almost identical to the the requirements for the project are basically do whatever you want except for it must use SQL. Um, and it must just use a uh Express, mm -hmm. and it must use uh what's the other one? Handlebars. Okay. So as long as you use those, it's, so it's basically it's fine. It's open-ended, but you have to use this specific list of technologies. Yeah, which makes sense because you, I mean, if you don't use what you learn, you're going to forget it right away. Right, absolutely. So coming coming off of your previous project and, you know, how your uh, idea selection process went, what ideas do you have this time for this new project? I'm not even going to try until I know what the group members want. Last time I came up with a huge list. And nobody wanted to do anything with it. Um, and that's fine. I don't really care what we do as long as we pick it quick. Uh, one of the other groups had a problem. Like, they wasted, like, three or four days just picking what they want to do. I would much rather double down on a bad idea than um, doing something I'm passionate or want to do. Sure. So, uh, before uh, you before you let your team members pick anything... What ideas do you have? Well, okay, I don't know if it's a good thing for school and stuff, but I want... So, you know, I have a lot of files, and I love anime and stuff. I'm like, I wonder if I could make a... Like a library-ish thing of all the animes that are happening this season and links to them and this little bios, descriptions, and everything and store what I've watched on... A little database thing. So let's say I wanted to watch a show with somebody. I want to keep track of episodes watched and something like that. Like just some way to better organize my anime watching life. Yep. I'm sure you can make that. Um, I don't have all the details. I don't know what I want to track. I just know that I want to see what's been recommended to me by friend. Who's recommended. Because you know how sometimes you have a friend that just recommends a bunch of bad shows. And then he's like, yeah, I'll add that to the list. But just like, no, you have crap taste i'm not listening to anything you say but then when you recommend an anime you normally have something that you know is hilarious or has good plot or something and so you would be in the better recommendations thing um so there's some way to keep track of all that and what's been watched and stuff and also like you know sometimes you've watched a show as it was coming out it was under its japanese name and then Five years later, you're like, what was that show called? And you have no bloody clue what it was and stuff. It would be yes. nice to be able to keep track of that. Yeah. So I think uh, I think what you're describing is a great personal project, and I hope you uh, find some time to do that. Oh, like 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 do something that I'm not supposed to do in a group? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think uh, what you're describing... Like do something I'm passionate about because I'm passionate about anime? I, I think so, at least. I think what you're describing is feasible for you to do in a few weeks. And you don't need to know anything about fancy front ends. You can do everything you just described simply with Express and Handlebars and uh, MySQL with SQLize. No problem. So you're, you're going to be on me for this because there's no way I'm going to do it on my own. And you know that. Yeah, so I'm, uh, I'm starting to be on you right now. 
Oh, jeez. Yeah, it's not like any of this was planned either. Like, it's not like I went into the section asking you what you wanted to work on personally. You know, your social engineering and fishing skills are pretty good. Yeah, man, I sure do love fishing. So that's pretty much what this week is going to be. So um, Tuesday and Thursday are going to be more about using SQLize. Um, because most of the first part of Saturday when we got introduced to SQLize was just recap of... This class started moving really fast after Express, or not Express, handlebars and stuff. Like, I'm not rock solid on it, um, and I've been having to go back and look at examples and everything else. Because it, there's a lot happening. Yes. And I can't do anything from scratch. I'm copying, pasting, and mutating it. it, it um, um, <laughs> if I don't have something to copy, I can't do it. It won't make you feel any better, but, so I, I just, uh, on Friday, uh, I, I had some time to do some other work that I need to get done. And, you know, I made a new React app and, uh, you know, it's a lot of work to start from scratch. So I just copied a bunch of stuff from another project. It was just faster. I just deleted stuff I didn't need. So you, you, you very rarely ever start from a pristine scratch. You will often restart from a, well, I did this recently. It looks good enough, close enough. Let's use it. So it's, it's yeah. well known. So do that a lot. I can explain chunks, but I could not do any of it without uh, reference. Yeah, and and you, but hopefully I'll start to learn more. And you need to practice with it, though. Remember, and you it. need you need to be able to conceptually explain something, even though you might not be rock solid on the implementation. If you can at least explain conceptually how something works, and you're able to field some high level questions about it, I think that's what matters in the short term. And practice through actually working on your own project is where the full intuition comes from last week you mentioned crud and stuff and so tuesday's thing is getting into the crud with sequelize nice. and then getting associated with relationships is thursday We're getting associated so. yeah the uh the the join capabilities of sequelize are quite fascinating and you'll enjoy those it sort of abstracts some of that you know left join outer join inner join right join stuff yeah, I was kind of shaky on that when we started doing that with SQL 2. And we, most of the stuff we do, we just do select all from that and then just handle it all in the JavaScript land. Yep, yep. And so SQLize will help make some of that a little bit easier and more palatable. Well, that makes me happy. And I think that's about it for the day. Where can we find you on the internet? You can find me just about everywhere, but especially on my Twitter at Rydamar and, of course, on my website, ryanrampersad.com. And where can we find you? You can find me on the people's page of the nexus.tv, and you can also find me on my website, matthewpetrel.com. We can visit your website now? Is it different? No, no, it's the same crap you posted. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Now you're framing me for having done it. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, okay. Yep. Yep. Uh, and, of course, you can leave comments for us on our Reddit at reddit.com slash r slash the nexus tv, and, of course, you can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash the nexus tv. And please enjoy the free fringe. Yes, the free fringe. It's very good. It's pretty funny. You'll enjoy it. Have a good one. The Nexus. The Nexus. The Nexus TV. Podcasts from, from the, the Technological, technological Convergence. convergence.